Hello, welcome to everyone for the next uh, capsule of international relations for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today we are talking about the assumption of the chairmanship of the G20 by India, specifically Prime Minister Narendra Modi. There is some jubilation in India about this particular position that India has acquired at a critical time in history. But we should remember that this was just a matter of alphabetical order after Indonesia, India. But sometimes in history, it happens that this kind of rotation sometimes lands the right country in the right place at the right time. So this particular election or nomination of India as G20 president at this time is full of uh, significance uh, because in the, the most difficult situation, that the most difficult problem that G20 is addressing is the Russia Ukraine war. And India's position on the war has been criticized by some, but it is getting greater acceptance in the last few weeks. And therefore, uh, the fact that India is now the chairman of G20 is seen as a good omen. And this was demonstrated by the fact that the recent Bali summit, where India was designated as the president of the G20, India played a very significant role. Even though G20 was established to deal with economic issues, it cannot escape from the political consequences and uh, economic problems arising out of uh, political situations. So G20 is emerging as a major force in the world uh, because all the important countries of the world are there. About 80% of the population is represented and the wealth is represented in G20. And um, unlike the Security Council, there is no veto in G20. And you may recall that in the 2008-2009, when there was a big uh, economic meltdown, it was G20 and uh, the contribution made by Dr. Manmohan Singh, which helped the world to come out of that uh, practical crisis. So India has enjoyed considerable clout in G20. And this time in Bali, where the last summit was held, the main point of discussion was Russia-Ukraine war. And uh, of course, most members of the G20 are totally against Russia. They all voted against Russia in the Security Council and the General Assembly. The only two countries who were uh, abstaining on this issue were India and China. In fact, we were criticized for voting with China on this issue, but we stuck to it till the last point. And India and China, for different reasons, uh, took a neutral stand. And uh, both of them are now also convinced that the war must end. So the general feeling in the G20 was to condemn Russia. The point of the Bali summit became to finding a solution uh, via mediation or arbitration or negotiations, some solution. Because if you are dealing with the economic system of the world, the end of the war was absolutely essential to save the world from the crisis, the food crisis and the energy crisis, which will aggravate very much if this goes beyond one year. It's already almost a year, just in th three months. By February, it will be a year. And before that, ending the war is an important objective. So you will find in the communique that was issued at G20, the emphasis not on con is not on condemnation of Russia, which of course it is there. It says that most of the members of the G21 criticized or, or, or deplored Russia. But the main thrust of the uh, G20 communique was that this war should end and the G20 should exert efforts. And the people are looking at Mr. Narendra Modi as the man who may be able to uh, find some kind of a way. And therefore, what is what the uh, G20 declaration, if you read it, you will find that most of the words they are used are from 
India's statements, because India has always been emphasizing the need for uh, peace, negotiation, democracy, etc., rather than war. The famous words that uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi used when he met Putin, this is not the era for war, it is the era of reconciliation, democracy, and negotiations. He said this to President Putin's face when they met, and, uh, and it was reported very widely. And these words have been actually put into the communique as the advice of the entire G20. This is no small accomplishment. The White House, the State Department, uh, said soon after the uh, summit that India's contribution to the formulation of the joint communique was very significant. And on top of it, President Biden himself has spoken yesterday about the big role that India played at the G20 in the context of the Ukraine-Russia war. So this is the first time that the United States and others are saying something good about India's position. So far, they have been saying that India is betrayed the cause of sovereignty, betrayed uh, non-aggression, such principles. So that is really the uh, reason why people are very hopeful. And Mr. Narendra Modi himself has said that he will be, of course, as chairman of the president of G20, he will have a continuing role till next year, till next December, and he will exert all his efforts to end the war, particularly if both the parties request him to do so. Whether they will request him to do so at this point is not known. But with the clout of G20, perhaps uh, India may be able to play a big role in the solution of this war. This expectation is what has made people in India somewhat jubilant. Some people say this is because of the personal qualities of uh, the Prime Minister. Some people say no, this is something, a result of what India has done ever since its independence. We have always argued for peace. We never uh, advocated war, etc. So the political game is going on. And the BJP is thinking that this will also do good for them in the 2024 elections. Anyway, that apart, the, opp opp the opportunity that India has got in this context is a golden opportunity, but at the same time, full of challenges. So it is an opportunity, but a lot of challenges because there will be so many, many important levels. First one is the situation in, on the ground uh, because reports show that Russia is, has, been able, has been forced to retreat from Kherson, which they had occupied, and they have lost a lot of soldiers. And, the, and Ukraine is in a kind of jubilant mood, even though they are also losing people and money and buildings every minute. But they also feel that they are on the verge of, uh, of victory. And um, with the approval of, uh, with, the, with President Biden having got the majority, maintained the majority in the Senate, that gives him an opportunity to give more money to Ukraine. And others also uh, might follow. So generally, in the NATO camp, uh, there is a certain amount of jubilation. And that may not be a good opportunity for negotiations, because if Russia is feeling the pinch of having to withdraw from occupied Ukraine territories, uh, by, by, Putin is likely to be more adamant and more aggressive, and he may actually uh, increase the uh, strength, the power, the force of the war. That is one reason. Secondly, China is also in the same position as India. And China will not look kindly at India, you know, taking the lead. And uh, if India is victorious, the kind of position that India will gain in the international community is a matter of concern for uh, Xi Jinping. Because Xi Jinping went to uh, Bali as a life president, life leader of the of China. And everybody was very keen to shake hands with him and talk to him and take photographs, etc. So he was a big hero there. So side by side with Mr. Modi, who has become the president, there is also this aspect that China would not like India to gain uh, prominence or importance in the next year. So China is likely to do things which would preempt India from doing a few things. 
So for both these reasons, the situation is very complex. And nobody can say whether any solution can be found. Uh, President Putin has given no indication of any change in his policy, while Mr. Zelensky is already saying that, uh, you know, uh, he should be declared a winner or should become a winner. And repeatedly, Zelensky called G20 as G19 because Russia was not there. I mean, Russia was there in the sense that uh, the foreign minister of Russia was there, but Mr. Putin naturally did not go. And the foreign minister was uh, in great trouble because everybody was attacking him, sneering at him, looking at him, and all this. And he actually left towards the end of the session, you know, criticizing everybody, and he left from there. So Zelensky is, seems to have an upper hand. This may not be true, militarily. So this is the atmosphere that we are entering into. Like the famous saying that we tread in, some people <laughs> uh, tread into areas where angels we have to tread. <laughs> so, I mean, that is not, we have not sought this. We have not uh, asked for it. This was some kind of a, uh, of a combination of circumstances which has thrust this on us. So we can only hope for the G20 meeting. We are planning in a big way. The next one year, we'll have more than 100 meetings in different parts of India to discuss various issues and come to compromises, consensus, etc. And we have our machinery, and we are very good at protocol, and uh, the meeting will be very, 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 very successful. But whether it will be able to solve the problem of Russia-Ukraine war, there is no guarantee of certainty. So that is the situation in which we are. But I'm sure India will do its best to, to do what it can. But if you look at the Bali summit, you will notice that uh, uh, the person who has uh, assumed great significance in the international community is Xi Jinping himself. And uh, even Mr. Narendra Modi walked up to him and shook hands with him. And he had meetings with several people. President Biden spent a long time with him. And the discussions were, it was the first time they are meeting after the pandemic. And uh, so they had a very good uh, conversation. And it looked as though both of them agreed to reset the relations between US and China. And that is an important development, which has significance for everybody. In fact, President Biden even said that he does not feel that China is about to attack Taiwan. I don't know on what basis he said that, but after the conversation, he said that to improve the atmosphere. So there is an improving atmosphere in uh, um, China-US relations. But at the time of the summit, at the same time, a report came that uh, some missiles, Russian missiles, hit the border of uh, Poland and killed two people. And the immediate suspicion was this was Russia. And therefore, the G7 countries called an emergency meeting uh, to consider this. And this put Russia in even a bigger difficulty. Uh, but luckily for Russia, it was conceded by the Poles that these were not Russian missiles. They were actually Ukrainian missiles which had lost their way and landed in Poland. So that was a reprieve for Russia. Otherwise, this would have aggravated the situation even more because there would be suspicion that Russia is uh, spreading the war beyond Ukraine. So that was a good sign. Uh, the others uh, dealt with uh, China. They all spoke to them. Australia, which is at uh, loggerheads with China, Prime Minister had a meeting. Um, had, except uh, UK. UK Prime Minister had a fixed a meeting with the Chinese president, but he did not attend it for some reason. And uh, other than that, most people who wanted meetings got it. And uh, Xi Jinping even criticized publicly uh, Prime Minister Trudeau for revealing the conversation that he had with him because China and Canada have been having some difficulties ever since the chief executive officer of a great ch big Chinese company was arrested and uh, jailed in Canada. So it may have been related to that. So, But he publicly chided him, as it were, for releasing this uh, content of their discussion. Of course, Trudeau was very conciliatory. He said, no, Mr. President, we can talk again. 
But then he walked away because after shaking hands with him, he said, let the atmosphere improve. So he was being tough with, uh, with Canada, which shows his uh, mindset. And uh, so he has gone back uh, with a new incarnation, having got international recognition. But how he'll behave in the G20 meetings in the next one year, how many of them he will attend, how much support he will give to India is yet to be seen. So unless there is some solution on the areas which have become you know, problematic on the line of actual control, uh, the relationship between India and China will remain um, estranged. And uh, therefore that uh, question will uh, arise. And on top of it, there is also India becoming the chairman of SCO, the Shanghai Corporation, which is uh, led by China. So it's important that uh, China should also cooperate. And therefore, all of them welcomed the Prime Minister of India's assumption of the, you know, the leadership of uh, G20. But looking at the uh, declaration uh, by the G20, which is a long one, about 52 paragraphs and so on. So as usual, they have uh, listed all the issues before the world and how to tackle them. But uh, because everybody is so preoccupied you know, with the Russia-Ukraine war, what has been put in there are all old ideas, no new ideas there. You know, things which have been said already in other declarations. Like, for example, coming to climate change, which is a serious problem. And at the same time, there was a COP27 taking place in Egypt. And still, in the declaration, there is very little about climate change, except to say that we will try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is like motherhood. Nobody can question it. And also on other issues like the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the question of supply chains. So issues on which uh, there are serious considerations. Prime Minister said, we now have a, have a fertilizer uh, shortage and this will become a food shortage very soon and an energy shortage very soon. So he stressed that it's very important for us to be so. But these things have also not been very clearly established there. But obviously the delegates did not have time to discuss all this. So the declaration also is more about Ukraine and Russia than about anything else. But the agenda of G20 is large and uh, we will devote attention to that. Uh, we have uh, designated several officials and also designated certain places where these meetings will be held on different aspects of G20. So G20 will definitely be a success in India. Even if uh, the, the Russia-Ukraine war is not resolved, but if it is not resolved, G20 will not have much of a success. And that may affect us if we are not able to do it. So on the one hand, it's a matter of a privilege that we have the president of G20. On the other hand, the dangers are, are too many. But the good thing is that uh, the Western countries have softened their attitude towards India. Because last few months, it has been a tug of war between India and European Union and NATO, and our foreign minister was very forthright in answering and uh, telling them the truth about uh, purchasing oil or dealing with Russia. But um, President Biden, by saying that India supported and played a big role in formulating the G20 declaration, is evidence uh, that there has been some relaxation and some value has been found for India's neutrality. So there, the only uh, competitor with us uh, will be uh, China, who also will want to appear to be uh, reasonable. In fact, uh, the president of France, uh, uh, Macron, has asked China rather than India uh, to start a mediation effort. And he has also suggested that he would want to visit Beijing if uh, the pandemic situation permits it. He would like to visit China next year. So there is a certain rivalry there. Uh, but if everything falls in place, it will be an important uh, uh, victory for India. 
And at the same time, the chairmanship of SEO provides a lot of opportunities for us to even improve relations with China. Pakistan has said that it may not go to SEO meeting in India because of the present situation, but the Chinese have not said so. And uh, in fact, there is some expectation that India's chairmanship will be uh, helpful. So we are reaching a kind of turning point in our role internationally. This is significant because increasingly people are looking at G20 as an alternative to the Security Council because there are the biggest developing countries, the biggest uh, developed countries, um, economically powerful countries are all there. And mercifully, there is no veto in G20. So it is assuming greater importance in the international field because when things are uh, vetoed in the Security Council, instead of going to General Assembly to simply have a symbolic resolution, uh, they could go to the G20 and try to reach consensus. So that is a hope which people are expecting. But of course, in international relations, nothing can be permanent. So we have to be very watchful. So what I wanted to underline was that the importance that India has assumed and uh, the elements of G20 and the possibilities of India resolving some of these issues uh, must be on your mind uh, when you go to the examination. Because by next year, uh, G20 will be over and um, maybe by the time your examination comes, there will be new developments. So you must certainly follow the developments in G20 from now to, uh, now to uh, 2023 November. So from Bali to Delhi is what we have to watch for. Thank you. Yes, that's a very legitimate question. But the uh, issue now is not diversion of missiles. The issue is uh, survival of that nation. That is Ukraine. But what could have happened would be that uh, they will be more careful in what they hand over to Ukraine. But actually, the demand is for more and more lethal weapons to be handed over to Ukraine. Uh, I suppose they have had some training in these things because NATO has been supporting them surreptitiously in the past. And uh, such things will not happen. This was not a very serious incident. It was only, only killed two people. And hundreds of thousands are being killed. You know, two people dying from uh, Poland will also will not be considered as a uh, grave mistake. And therefore, uh, I don't think there will be any change on the part of USA and uh, uh, NATO in its policy towards supplying of uh, weapons to Ukraine. Because the Prime Minister will soon, the President, President Biden will soon be going to the Senate for more money for Ukraine. And that is the only policy that they, they feel will work in weakening Russia. Nobody can say. Even President Putin will not be able to say that. There is always a chance. There is always pressure on them, both from internally and externally. So it can happen, but nobody can predict it. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? The NATO is a military alliance. And this is just a grouping of countries. That's a big difference. But many NATO countries are in it, together with developing countries also. So it's a highly representative body. Though nobody has really, it was created by G7. You know, G7 found that they could not resolve the issues. G7 are the most powerful seven countries of the world. So during the 2008 uh, economic crisis, that is when G7 felt the need to have a bigger grouping. And that is how they invited many important developing countries to join. And so G20 was formed. Of course, G20 was formed earlier at a ministerial level, but it became a summit level only in 2008, 2009. And, um, and so it has that capacity. And that's the difference between NATO and uh, G20.
I don't know really how Australian FTA will affect us. Uh, but um, the Australians became estranged uh, with China in the recent past, just before the pandemic. But uh, the Australian Prime Minister met Xing Jinping and they seem to have had a, a friendly discussion. Actually, Australian position was much stronger against China than we were, ours were. And so Australia was a very good partner. But how it will affect the Indian economy, I simply don't know. We have to find out. We are also seeking trade agreements from other countries, like UK, for example. But it looks as though UK is not ready. USA is not ready. As I have explained many times before, because of the indefinite situation politically around the world, uh, people are reluctant to enter into long-term agreements. That is the that is the mood. Uh, but in some cases, it may happen, and uh, the Australian F FTA agreement may come into into force. And there are also other trade agreements in, in South and Southeast Southeast Asia, for which we are we are not party. So all these will have a, a play as far as our economy is concerned, but I have no economist to explain how it will specifically affect. So when when it happens, then we'll get back to it. Yes, so we are not talking to them. That's our policy, isn't it? So, but we must be in touch in some form or the other. It's not that we are not communicating with them at all. But formally, our position is that we will not negotiate whatever is the issue. Well, that is our assumption. Always. And that is why, except for that one agreement that Bangkok, which was held in Bangkok, from which we walked away, you know, all other agreements, or the FTAs, we have been in favor of it. But uh, we also have some rethinking because we feel that globalization has not helped us as much as we expected. And so we are also moving towards uh, Atmanar Bhar Bharat, uh, which means that more and more self-reliance rather than trade agreements, etc. But it's a mix. And uh, this applies to us also in the sense that uh, we also are not ready to jump into agreements. But USA and UK, uh, we had... Uh, um, reached a stage of completing it. And so that came as a disappointment. And when this will be restored, we will know. Okay then. Thank you very much. See you again. Bye-bye.